Good morning, everyone in Europe. Good morning, everyone in. Uh, good evening, everyone in uh, New Zealand and Australia. We're very pleased to have Dr. Jackie Clark presenting a Pain in Motion Masterclass today. Uh, Jackie is trained as a physiotherapist uh, and she obtained her PhD from two universities, a joint PhD from the University in Manchester and a university in Brussels. And uh, after that, she has done postdoc work as well, following up her exciting findings from her PhD. And uh, Jackie also has massive uh, teaching experience. Uh, she used to be uh, the most popular kinetic control uh, teacher. That's a long time ago, but, she, but I keep her reminding uh, about uh, this. And um, of course, she's got a lot of uh, presentation uh, experience on conf conferences as well. And she has massive clinical experience in her private practice in New Zealand. She's uh, probably the Pain in Motion member with the most uh, living in the most beautiful environment uh, on this planet. Although Felipe Reis from, um, um, from Rio de Janeiro will probably disagree. But probably the most important thing that I have to mention when I introduce Jackie is that, Jackie is that she is a wonderful, open and kind personality. And that's all I want to say, uh, because I don't want to take too much time away from you, Jackie. And um, so I give you the opportunity now to present your masterclass. Good luck. Well, thank you very much, Jim, and thank you for the invite. I'm really honored to be able to do this for Pain in Motion, fantastic group. So um, I wanted to talk to you about um, sensory hyposensitivity because sensory hyposensitivity is less discussed when it comes to nociplastic pain compared with hypersensitivity. Um, so I'll just give you a very brief overview of how we're going to approach this and I'll try and get it wrapped up well within the hour so that we've got time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, trait anxiety um, and trauma and how these relate to hyposensitivity in people with persistent pain. Um, so traumatised people, as I said in the abstract, can respond to threats in various ways. As some of them go into a lot of hypersensitivity of the senses, but often you'll find that they also can um, shut down the senses. So they dissociate um, or some people call it conversion um, and they might have a, a whole limb that's, that's actually quite numbish and hyposensitive, but like a form of neglect. Um, so these are all uh, clinical signs that I've seen in, in my work with patients with persistent pain. And also there are quite a number of researchers around the world who have been looking into hyposensitive uh, characteristics in people with persistent pain that I want to alert you to as well. Um, more recently, there have been some studies specific to anxiety and sensory hyposensitivity. So I'll show you those as well. And a few little case studies from the clinic because I think it's quite nice to share the reality of what happens on the ground, as it were, um, with persistent pain patients with you. And then we'll talk about how this might be um, assessed and maybe treated from a clinical perspective. I won't spend much time on the treatment because there isn't a whole heap of evidence surrounding it yet, but it's what I'm developing in my clinical work at the moment. How that might be implicated for further research. So you'll be familiar with the most recent algorithm for identifying nociplastic pain. And um, in, in it, you'll notice that there is a big emphasis on the hypersensitivity phenomena. So we're used to seeing um, hypersensitivity to light touch. So your allodynia and hyperpathia, so lingering pain afterwards, and such hypersensitive responses to stimuli, sensory stimuli. But what it doesn't mention is hyposensitivity. Sometimes you have patients who have persistent pain that meet most of the criteria for nosoplastic pain, but who don't actually have hypersensitivities as the predominant factor, but in fact have hypo. So that's what I want to sort of open up for discussion and, and show you what I've found, what I've observed, and perhaps how it might be incorporated into a, an algorithm at some point. Who knows? We'll have to discuss that at the end. So. Um, Joe kindly mentioned my uh, research that I did through 
uh, VUB actually in Manchester as well. Um, and what we found in this uh, study was that people with predominantly nociplastic pain, which was clinically recognised according to the 2014 algorithm, as was then, um, people with nociplastic pain in a chronic back pain population, we were able to find that the central sensitization inventory scores, which is an indication of the nociplastic symptoms extent, was predicted by other questionnaire scores, particularly sensory sensitivity. So sensory sensitivity is where um, it's measured on the adult adolescent sensory profile, which is a Brown and Dunn publication. And it looks at the way people process their senses. So auditory, visual, taste and smell, movement, proprioceptive senses. And people with sensory sensitive profiles have a, a low threshold for sensory overwhelm. And um, they also have a passive response. Sorry, my uh, timer is going on its own here. They have a passive response to being overstimulated. So these people have a low threshold for sensory stimulation and will often get overwhelmed and overloaded with sensory stimulation and don't um, adapt to that. They have a passive response. So people with high scores in that profile also had high scores of the extent of nosoplastic symptoms on the CSI. Also, people with the high CSI scores um, were predicted by high trait anxiety scores. And trait anxiety, forgive the uh, timing here, trait anxiety is a stable personality trait that indicates a person's proneness to respond to threats with physiological hyperarousal. So the, the uh, state anxiety is that physiological hyperarousal. So people with high tendency towards that also had high scores on the CSI. So far, that all makes sense because that would fit in with people's um, profiles according to the nociplastic symptoms and the algorithm for identifying hypersensitivity. But what we didn't expect was low registration profiling. So low registration profiles are people with a high sensory threshold for sensory stimulation which means that they need a lot of stimulus to feel healthy and functional. Um, so the people with low registration profiles are actually hyposensitive in some of their senses. And this is what we found when we did the, um, the prediction study for predicting the, the uh, correlation between the high scores of CSIs and the high scores on those profiles. So that was what alerted me to the fact that, um, that central sensitization doesn't always come with just hypersensitivity. So the other thing that we looked at was um, contexts around how their pain developed. And we found through a qualitative study that a lot of the people who had nociplastic pain and high scores on their CSIs also had dyslexia or ADHD, so attention uh, deficit hy attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, so ADHD, and those sorts of learning difficulties were in the group of people who had nociplastic pain. And the reason that was interesting was because people with learning differences or learning difficulties have differences in the way they process their senses as well. So if that's a pre-morbid character trait, um, then it may put them in a, in a risk sort of category for developing nociplastic pain, but this was just an observational qualitative study, so there's no prediction um, here yet when it comes to developmental learning differences, but a very interesting observation. Um, another characteristic of people who um, developed nociplastic pain was that pre-morbidly they were low in confidence and low in control, a sense of control and lack of control in people's lives and anxiety often go together. Um, so that probably wasn't quite so surprising. Also in pre-morbid lives before the development of nociplastic pain were um, histories of trauma. So this was physical trauma, like physical abuse in relationships or emotional trauma. Physical could have also been motor vehicle accidents and things like that and um, emotional trauma would often be abusive relationships and situations. 
and then also it could be childhood traumas and or, or adulthood. So this is quite a, a, a common finding amongst the people who we interviewed with nociplastic pain. And then uh, interestingly as well, pre-morbidly, people often had physical and emotional sensitivities. So they were sensitive before they developed their pain. And subsequently, we have done a study to show that the um, sensory profiles for high sensitivity are predictive of the development of central sensitization at 12 weeks in acute low back pain. So take the measurements at baseline and then remeasure at 12 weeks. And sure enough, the ones that had high sensory sensitive profiles were predictive of high CSI scores. So um, to just summarize that then, the contributing factors that we we discuss the possible pathway that would end up with nociplastic pain, there are various factors that contribute towards the development of nociplastic pain, it would seem from what we found so far. And so that would be sensory thresholds. So if you have a low sensory threshold or in the low registration profile, a high sensory threshold, so relatively high po sensitive in some senses, um, contributes towards nociplastic pain symptoms, um, quite likely. And then we've got personal characteristics, so the metacognition of it. So when people have a low threshold, how much do they actually perceive of their sensory input? And how much do they um, feel confident in their accuracy of interpreting sensory input? The sensory input is very is one thing, um, but actually interpreting and, and actioning those things is quite another. So there are metacognitive processes that also go with um, the development of nosoplastic pain quite possibly. And then, of course, coping styles. Earlier, you might have noticed that one of the predictive factors um, predicting high scores on the CSI was an extreme defensive high anxious coping style. So. What a defensive high anxious coping style is, is somebody with high trait anxiety. So they have a high tendency to respond to threats with um, high physiological arousal. Coupled with high social desirability or defensiveness. So they don't want the world to, to know that things are, are going wrong or they don't want people to know that they're a highly anxious person. They're usually in a responsible position or a caring position position. But on the inside, uh, they know they're heightened and they're in flight or fight a lot of the time. And they have a tendency to interpret bodily feedback for threat. So it's a threatening symptom and then that creates more anxiety, which ramps up symptoms further because we know there are relationships between high anxiety and high central sensitization and nociplastic pain. So um, those, all of those factors can go together and may all contribute towards the development of nociplastic pain based on our research, but also other studies, which I'll highlight to you in just a moment. So let's move on to sensory hypo sensitivity found in other people's studies. So um, some of the earliest people to recognize sensory hypo sensitivity in chronic pain populations um, were Malis Gagnon, who's a, um, a Toronto University researcher, and um, Nicholson. And they, they um, found that 25 to 40% of patients with chronic pain, actually their first study looked at fibromyalgia patients, um, showed widespread sensory deficits. And they were fascinated, as I was when I first read that, because fibromyalgia is considered to be a hypersensitivity disorder, and your classic as was central sensitization condition or nociplastic pain condition now. But 25 to 40 percent of them um, had altered sensory sensitivity, whereby they were hypo sensitive right down one half of their body. So they'll often have this what they called hemi hypo on the side of, of pain or in, in fibro cases, the, the side of worst pain. So that's quite interesting. That's not just hypersensitivity of the senses and to pain. You'll be familiar with Lorimer Mosley's work and how there was quite a lot of interest in tactility, which is the ability to discriminate between different senses or um, different stimuli accurately through the skin. 
And even in the event where there was no allodynia or hypersensitivity, chronic low back pain patients were often found to have low sensitivity or reduced ability to determine tactile uh, sensations through the skin accurately. And the same was found um, in Kately's study in 2014. So there has been you know, murmurings of some elements of hyposensitivity, certainly in, in chronic back pain in those instances. It's also been looked at in um, whiplash associated disorder. So that's the WAD. Um, but, but most people originally were thinking, well, perhaps it's neuropathic because the actual whiplash itself has caused some neuronal damage. So perhaps that's why they've got um, reduced sensation, usually in the arm, in the, in the WAD cases. Um, but subsequent studies have found that actually there are both peripheral and central components. Um, so there, there may not, it, it may not just be nerve damage or neuropathic. It, there can actually be some sensory hyposensitivity, but interestingly, not in idiopathic neck pain. So then you think, well, why is it just the whiplash associated disorder that shows this hyposensitivity that's not neuronal damage? And that could be because it's a trauma related accident or injury is whiplash. Trauma seems to be very closely linked to hypo sensitivity. Um, they looked at CRIPS-1 as well, so CRPS, chronic re uh, complex regional pain syndrome, um, and found that warm and cold hypoesthesia was present in the CRPS-1 patients in that particular study. So again, a different pain population with elements of sensory hyposensitivity. Going back to Melis Gagnon, um, the, the work that they did, she actually called the, um, or they, sorry, called the sensory hyposensitivity non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits. And this struck me because when we first used the 2014 algorithm to identify central sensitization, one of the things that we looked for was non-dermatomal or non-anatomically plausible um, pain distributions. And so what they found um, also, this was back in 2001, was that people with reduced sensory perception in non-dermatomal distributions down one half of their body had um, raised thresholds for pressure pain thresholds. So they were, had reduced light touch awareness, reduced pinprick, reduced pressure pain thresholds, reduced vibration, sorry, increased pressure, pressure pain thresholds because it was less sensitive, uh, reduced vibration sense, deep pressure hyposthesia. So they had some hyposensitivities, but they also had extreme sensitivity to light touch. So light touch will often be highly irritating, whereas deep pressure they couldn't really feel very much at all. Um, and because it was non-dermatomal, then it wasn't neuropathic in nature. And, and it would often be across one half of the, the body. And, uh, and so they call these non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits, which I want to highlight to you. They found these in CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. Um, they found it in fibromyalgia and they found it in chronic musculoskeletal pain populations as well. Um, so there are some various studies that have been done um, more recently on non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits, and uh, they found that actually using fMRI scans, that there's usually a psychobiological substrate, which is usually related to post-traumatic experiences. So they've usually had a trauma. So trauma seems to um, create a response of sensory shutdown or sensory neglect of certain parts of the body. And they found that people with non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits usually have traits of high anxiety, which is similar to what we found in our study with people with nosoplastic pain symptoms. Um, and in comparison to pain only patients, so, so persistent pain and then persistent pain with non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits, in comparison to the pain only patients, had far fewer sensory motor changes in the sensory motor cortex. So the brain changes were less severe in pain only and more severe in people with non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits and pain. So what happens often is when people have a, a major trauma, um, 
they can go into conversion disorder or functional neurological disorder, which is where they dissociate due to the extent of the trauma, which creates hyposensitivity. So um, researchers have found that um, people with this persistent pain and hyposensitivity through non-dermatomal somatosensory deficits have traits of higher anxiety, often a history of trauma, they have higher thresholds in quantitative sensory testing and much higher levels of pain and um, wider areas of pain as well, so more extensive pain locations, and generally have a much higher burden of disease than people with just persistent pain. So these people really are in a lot more strife, it would seem, than people with, with just the pain sensitivity. Um, and you've, you've seen this with CRPS patients, often they've got really very little sensory awareness or accurate sensory awareness of where their limb is. All they can feel is, is just pain. But when you try and test their senses, apart from light touch hypersensitivity, their proprioceptive awareness, ability to, to judge where the limb is, is very, very poor. And they've usually got quite high levels of disability. So from clinical observations perspective, I get a lot of people, well, the vast majority of my people with persistent pain also have high anxiety. And certainly in our PhD study, my PhD study that we did together, um, people with um, high anxiety were the, the prevalent, um, it was a prevalent trait in, in all the people with low back pain, chronic low back pain and central sensitization symptoms. And um, there was nobody in that particular group of 165 people from three different countries with low trait anxiety. So it seems to be a very much part of what goes on with the, this heightened physiological arousal and that relationship with nociplastic pain um, increase as well. So what seems to happen is that the extra receptors or receptors that um, are looking into the outside environment, um, they're aware of potential threats. So the extra receptors might be um, light sensitivity, visual field, um, sound sensitivity, taste and smell become very heightened. And so they're, they're often light sensitive and sound sensitive, but almost as if it's at the expense of body feedback. So the body feedback, the interoceptors are quite poor. So they'll usually have poor balance when you test them with the Romberg or tandem Romberg test, very poor proprioceptive awareness so joint repositioning is, is hopeless. Um, very poor awareness of their breathing. Um, and you try and teach them breathing strategies and they really can't connect with their um, breathing interoceptors. And so it, it's very difficult for them to interpret bodily sensations accurately. So it's a, a pattern that, that you see in the clinic is hyper in some senses and very much hypo in the bodily feedback senses which is interesting. Um, that's not including if somebody has a specific pathology that they're being hypervigilant about within their body. So if, if they've got a back pain problem and they're hypervigilant towards that back pain, or I had a girl today with and what she thought was tooth pain, but it was bilateral T and J and something going on underneath the jaw because she'd interpreted it as a tooth pain and she was insisting there was pathology there so she was constantly hypervigilant on that particular area. But the rest of her had all these patterns. So her sight, sound, um, smell, taste, actually not taste with her, just smell was really heightened. But the interoceptors, her body feedback, balance um, and proprioception were, were atrocious, I had no idea. So that seems to be quite a common pattern clinically in the presence of high anxiety in these nociplastic pain patients. And um, some colleagues of mine down at Otago University, um, Olivia Harrison, actually, she's just moved back from Europe. So she did this study in Europe um, and her colleagues in the UK did the first one. So what they found was that people with moderate level, levels of anxiety, not even high anxiety, had reduced visual per perception. So what they did was they had two, uh, two dot boxes and they asked them to see, ask the participants, to tell them which box had the most number of dots in. And then secondly, most importantly as well, how confident were they that they got that perceptive, perceived difference accurately? 
um, and they found that people with uh, low anxiety were always confident that they perceived the difference accurately. So they're testing visual perception. And whereas people with moderate anxiety were not confident and they often got it a bit more inaccurate as well. So they took that dot box study to the next stage, which was looking at breathing interoceptive awareness. And people with moderate anxiety have poor interoceptive feedback and perception of whether or not they're breathing through a resisted um, apparatus or just breathing freely. So they got them to breathe freely and through a tube. And then they added just a little bit of resistance or a lot of resistance. And they asked them, you know, what, what was the difference between the two? And then how how confident were you that you got it right? So was it a lot of resistance or a little resistance, etc. And so they found that people with moderate anxiety really had very little idea about how accurate they were and how confident they were about that perception as well. So it's interesting that people with anxiety traits have this reduced body interoceptive feedback, which is a kind of hyposensitivity again. So it um, seems to, seems to come out from various uh, different research bodies, similar findings of hyposensitivity in chronic pain patients. Now, this is a patient, um, Joe will recognise this as one of my little clinics. I've got a little clinic at home called the Physio Shed, um, which I do some work from, and then I've got another clinic in town. But this lady has um, functional neurological disorder. So her whole left leg was really quite numb. She, she couldn't feel the left leg and she literally sort of dragged it around. If you look very closely when she walks in a moment, you'll see that she's also constructed a left foot drop splint <laughs> to stop her foot completely flopping and dragging on the ground. Hopefully this will play. If you watch when she, she hitches her hip to get that foot over the step, to get in through the door, see it's like a hip foot. In she goes, just using quadratus lumborum, nothing else. Um, so really very little motor control with that left leg whatsoever. She's just dragging it. So she had a trauma, a truck hit the front left side of the car. Um, nothing was broken, no lumbar binding. But within 24 hours, she lost the use of her left leg. And when she gets very um, heightened and overwhelmed by the trauma, she also loses a little bit of hearing in her left ear, which is interesting. It's something to do with the um, functional neurological disorder. They tend to go into a bit of sensory shutdown um, when they're in heightened physiological arousal. So she had a lot of pain down that left leg, even though she couldn't feel it. So there was a lot of pain generated to the area, even though she couldn't feel it. And this is without her, her homemade foot drop splint. And you'll see that that left foot is just literally dragging, nothing there. So a painful, hyposensitive limb. Um, so I just want to draw your attention, attention to functional neurological disorder, because actually I have seen a number of these people in clinic and they come because they're in a lot of pain and they can't function but they have no neurological pathology. So they've been through the neurologist, they've had scans, there's no neurological um, pathology. And this is the DSM-5 criteria um, for how to identify it. And um, it, there's a little bit of overlap with fibromyalgia in so much as there's no other medical condition, no other medical condition or, or mental disorder. Um, and there's an incompatibility between symptoms, uh, looking at point B there, and recognised neurological or medical conditions. So it, it's not due to pathology. But commonly, they have this motor weakness or paralysis, which you've just seen in the video, and also this anaesthesia or sensory loss. Um, and interestingly, down on the bottom there, it says hearing disturbance is one of the potential other symptoms. And this lady does get shut down of her hearing when she's really heightened in physiological arousal. Interestingly enough, and there is discussion amongst researchers at the moment about this, pain is not mentioned in the DSM-5 criteria. So although it is quite common to have pain with very little sensory input, it isn't always the case that FND comes with pain. <laughs> 
but it is being discussed, uh, discussed currently. Um, so another uh, study that was, um, there were a couple of studies here actually, done by Ranford only a couple of years ago, used the sensory profile, which I'd used in my PhD, um, and found quite similar things, that people in, with functional neurological disorder, which some psychologists call conversion disorder because they convert their distress into physical symptoms, um, they think they convert their distress into physical symptoms because physical symptoms is more controllable somehow. These people feel really out of control and highly anxious and traumatised. So they convert all that distress into physical outpourings. Um, but what they found uh, in people with functional neurological disorder was that they had lots of anxiety, but also they had low registration profiles, which is this hypo sensitivity sensory profiles with a passive adaptive response to being under stimulated. So low registration, they're again passive responders rather like the sensory sensitives are passive responders to being overwhelmed by sensory information. So that was very interesting because that overlapped with the findings that we found with chronic uh, low back pain as well, very similar profiles. Obviously it's a subjective questionnaire, so there's a lot of information that's missing out of that, but it's just an interesting overlap. Um, and so what they think as well, these other um, researchers at the bottom here, is that there, it's a protective response. When somebody goes into high fight or flight, they dissociate or detach themselves from a situation to protect themselves. And it's learned behavior from quite young very often. Often they had poor attachments with um, the caring or parent um, relationships in their lives as young people. So they developed these protective mechanisms. And when you see a lot of people with persistent pain and you get used to interviewing them and, and drawing out information, very, very often they've had abusive upbringings or traumatic backgrounds or ACE, so um, adverse childhood events. So yeah, so what, what was interesting was that this sensory hyposensitivity has been found in a number of other studies in relation to anxiety and in relation to chronic pain. So there are definitely some overlapping uh, factors going on here. It's very common, uh, sorry, more common, I should say, in females, um, and there's often a high rate of depression as well, of as, well as anxiety, and they've, as I said, had adverse life events in the past. So this, um, I don't know if you can see this, but this person, again, it's actually the same person you saw a moment ago, um, trying to just get her balance standing up. I've asked her just to stand against the wall for me. And she just, I just wanted her to move to her right just a little bit so I could get the camera in the center, very simple instruction. But the drama trying to just move. So she just refuses to wait there through that left leg properly. Just even shuffling around. And you can see there's a bit of dependent edema or swelling around that left ankle because she just doesn't have any muscle pump. Totally. Um, detached from that limb. Um, so people who have had trauma do exhibit altered sensory processing. And when people are overwhelmed with excessive sensory input because their senses are so sensitive and they have a low threshold, these are the people that can um, initiate a, a fight or flight response because the um, central nervous system becomes over overstimulated and over yeah overstimulated by sensory information and they're often the ones who get to the end of the day and they're so tired because they're over barraged by sensory information but they're wired and cannot get to sleep at all so of course we know that reduced sleep function also contributes towards increased nociplastic pain symptoms as well um, so trauma does have uh, these these traits of sensory hypersensitivity and physiological hyperarousal. Um, and that can develop into sensory defensiveness, which is where people just avoid, avoid, you know, lots of fear avoidance. But also um, the sensory hyposensitivity and shutdown occurs in people who have had trauma as their protective mechanism. And that actually has a lot to do with how people develop. If they've had childhood trauma, then um, the way that their 
systems are in defense all the time and evaluating for threat all the time shapes the way that they have the capability to self-regulate or not. So self-regulation is if someone is highly stressed, how do they actually um, bring down their fight or flight so that they're in more control? Um, so the fight, flight, freeze response is something you're probably already familiar with, but it's just worth mentioning here because what we normally have is a situation where it's normal in an acute stress situation to have a bit of sympathetic input so you get some arousal of the system um, and you start to feel a respiratory rate increase, heart rate increase, a bit of tightness in the chest, a bit of dizziness, feeling a bit wired and that's the normal um, state anxiety response to threats and stressors. So the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, puts on the accelerator and you begin to feel symptoms when you're beginning to be quite hyper aroused here. However, in people who have been traumatised, there's a much lower arousal threshold. So it doesn't take much sensory stimulus or stressors to start to develop these symptoms. And people who have high anxiety are prone to being overstimulated with a much lower threshold. So the sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive. And when the sympathetic nervous system is really cr cranked up, then they can actually reach a point where they're, they're really extremely over aroused, hyper aroused in the physiological system. And then they feel out of control and overwhelmed. So, I mean, again, in an acute state situation, that can be normal. And what we like to see is that the parasympathetic decelerates it all and brings it back down to the aftermath, which is the rest and digest when someone feels a bit wiped out and fatigued after a big shock or stressful situation. But what can happen with the freeze scenario is that you get this extreme sympathetic drive coupled with extreme parasympathetic slamming on the brakes at the same time. So it's like having one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake at the same time, um, which creates this freeze response. So the person just goes into freeze or they'll pass out. And people with functional neurological disorder will often pass out if they're just overstimulated or they'll dissociate and shut down. So they'll lose sensation in a leg or lose sensation in an arm as they shut down as part of that freeze response. So the whole autonomic response, the HPA axis is all part of that. Um, and so it's interesting that they do, that the protective response involves hypo sensitivity of the senses. So what I think probably happens then, this is my little hypothesis, is that um, the central nervous system needs sensory feedback to interpret all the time what's happening both internally and externally, we know that, but it's for safety as well as for homeostasis. So that feedback, the sensory feedback is required at all times. And the in high threat situations or in people who have been traumatized and therefore tend to interpret for threat all the time or much of the time, their extra receptors become hypersensitive at the expense of the interoceptors, as I mentioned earlier. So proprioception and body feedback is very poor. And this loss of body interoceptive feedback or the misinterpretation of altered sensory feedback may in itself be interpreted as threatening because the CNS needs that information um, for, for homeostasis. And so the threat may come from a loss of feedback just as much as interpretation of excessive feedback. So sensory feedback is such a big part of, um, of the whole threat evaluation and, um, and then pain is generated uh, even with poor sensation. So someone who can't feel a limb can still have a very painful limb even though they can't feel it so you rub it and they can't really feel it very well or you pinprick them and they can't really feel it and yet it's very painful so that's a cns most likely generated by the cns in response to this lack of sensory feedback if this hypothesis has any truth to it so that's kind of the model that i've been thinking about so i just thought i would show you a couple of case studies um, just briefly. You might want to move the little square icon at the bottom of the screen if it's getting in the way of the writing. <laughs> um, so 
this lady um, had has had three years of knee pain. She just did a very basic little MCL sprain um, mowing the lawns the year before, three years ago, and she's had lots of pain, lots of um, sensations of weakness, just not feeling that her knee properly belongs to her. Um, she, when she came to see me, she didn't have any swelling. She already had had her previous MRI scan, which was normal. Um, but when we did some sensory testing, she was hypersensitive to pinprick. And it may have been because the prickly thing I had, which was the, actually the back end of a vernier caliper, it just has a little piece of wire on it, which I use for pinprick, very basic. Could have been a bit threatening to her, somebody approaching her with a spiky thing. Um, but also she had a quite significant hyposensitivity. So light touch was hyposensitive. She couldn't feel where it was, where I was rubbing with the cotton wool. And um, also pressure sensitivity. So it just pressed with my thumb and she couldn't feel what was happening. So when I got her to lie supine, um, I got her to feel this, the perception of her limbs. So did it with the arms first and then with the legs. And what we do in supine is you ask them to perceive or to feel a sense of size. So do both arms feel the same size or does one arm feel slightly larger or smaller than the other? And then same with weight, does one feel slightly heavier or lighter than the other? So you ask them about their sensory perception of each limb. And on that left leg, it felt larger and heavier to her. And it felt sort of absent and not very present. So she had sensory hyposensitivity down one leg. Um, her profiling was that she had high scores for trait anxiety and high defensiveness. So she um, had a defensive high anxious coping style, which is the one that interprets for threat and the one that pays attention to multiple different stimuli from the body, interpreting those for threat. Um, she also had a very high score on low registration. So she has a high sensory threshold requiring a lot of input to function healthily and a passive response to being understimulated. So that kind of fitted in quite well with the profiling that we've been finding with nociplastic pain patients. Um, she also had a high score for sensory sensitive because she was light and sound sensitive. So again, that's that the extra receptors being highly sensitive. And she had a moderately high CSI score of 48. So she was above that threshold of 40. But sometimes when you've got hypo sensitivities, you may not get such a, a high score on the CSI, but that doesn't always happen. There's no correlation, it's just an observation. And sure enough, with interviewing her in more depth, she had quite a long history of multiple various um, traumatic events in her life. And, um, and so she did have a tendency to go into fight or flight a lot of the time and when that happened her pain of course was ramped up and she also lost more sensation in her leg when she was more heightened physiologically. So that's one example. She just came a couple of weeks ago so I just threw that one in. So in terms of assessment I mentioned to you the um, adult adolescent sensory profile. I actually do use this one a lot partly because I always got used to it through the PhD and had the license to use it. But um, it's very, very useful for establishing um, whether someone has low registration, because if you've got someone with low registration, then you, you're going to have to look for those hyposensitive senses and address those rather than just dealing with hypersensitive senses to try and balance their sensory processing and, and reduce their pain that way. Um, also, I, I do check for the um, anxiety and the coping style. Because if they're a defensive, high anxious person, you know that you're going to have to help them to understand to not be so hyper vigilant and that they do interpret for threat and try and reframe their thinking in that way. But the other reason that I look for coping style is that there is another type of coping style called repressor. Now, the repressor is the person who self evaluates on the questionnaire as being low anxiety, low trait anxiety. So they genuinely think that they're cool as a cucumber and that everything's okay with them. But when they're tested physiologically in previous studies, they actually show just as much heightened physiological arousal in terms of state anxiety response to threats as their high anxious counterparts. So repressors tend to underscore on questionnaires. So um, 
you may have seen this on one of the, the papers that we wrote in Pain in Motion uh, last year, was that the um, central sensitization inventory scores may be confounded by repressor personality types because they tend to underscore information that might be seen to be negative about themselves. So it's useful to have that if you're if you have to use questionnaires as part of your outcome measures for um, clinical usage and indeed research. Um, and then I'll also check for whether they've had trauma and mostly they have. And here it is learning difficulties as well, because learning difficulties seems to leave people with altered sensory processing as a precursor. So they, they probably had that pre morbidly um, and therefore you need to be dealing with some of their sensory processing abnormalities to help them normalize and to reduce their tendency to go into fight or flight heightened physiological arousal all the time. And then I also mentioned to you about lying down, lying the person down, <laughs> this is a cute little picture, um, and asking them of their perceptive perception of differences between the limbs in terms of weight, size, temperature and movement perception. Um, the first time I read about that was Candice McCabe when she was doing it for people with um, complex regional pain syndrome. And then uh, Joe will remember this in the New Zealand Pain Society conference that we had in 2017. There was an Australian psychologist who was also using this and um, helping people to, uh, to retrieve more normal sensory feedback from their limbs when they have reduced sensory feedback with a view to reducing pain during that session. So that's something I do use as well. And then of course you can test their sensations. So they'd have reduced vibration sense, um, light touch pinprick. Sometimes pinprick can be high, sometimes it can be low in terms of sensory threshold and then pressure uh, thresholds. So your usual quantitative sensory testing for patients. So this was a, another case study, 45 year old lady. She had wide, widespread pain um, and she'd come to see me or she'd been referred to see me because she had persistent left hip and thigh pain, um, which just wasn't going away. So she scored very high on the high on the trait anxiety. So she was very prone to uh, interpreting for threat. She had quite a high score on the central sensitization inventory and also had low registration and sensory sensitive profiles, which is hyper and hypo sensitivity with passive responses to being overstimulated or understimulated respectively. I also checked the fibromyalgia diagnostic criteria because of the way that she was presenting and sure enough, she did meet the criteria for fibromyalgia as well. So this lady was in, you know, quite a lot of unhealthy strife at the time. And when I started exploring her after I've taken a long history, her senses and her sensations and sensory perceptions, she had um, hemi hypoesthesia all down one side in both the arm and the affected leg. So she had this left hip and thigh pain, but and she had very hypoesthetic sensations down the left leg, but also the arm, even though she wasn't as symptomatic in the arm. When we did the lying down test, her left arm and leg felt larger and more absent to her, just didn't feel like it was present. She couldn't really feel where it was very well compared with her other side. Um, so light touch and pinprick and pressure were all hypoesthetic on that left leg, but she didn't have any allodynia. So this was a case where there was no hypersensitivity on the sensory testing despite her sensory sensitive profile suggesting she had some hypersensitivity, but her hypersensitivity was just light and sound. Body feedback was all poor. So she had no allodynia on testing, no temporal summation, which I just do a very crude temporal summation test. I just tap with a cotton wool bud and ask them if it gets less, stays the same or gets more. And she had um, no changes whatsoever. So no evidence of temporal summation. Um, and then I, let, I tested her two point discrimination and she had significantly different ability to detect to detect the difference between two points touching her skin versus one point from, from the left side compared, compared to the right side. And when I did the left leg, um, she couldn't feel twos and ones when the points got closer than nine, just under nine and a half centimetres, which is quite far apart for a leg, really. It was six centimetres on the right. 
but it made her feel really peculiar. She said, oh, just even the sensation of trying to determine what that sensation was. It was so unclear to her brain that it set off some sort of response and made her feel quite peculiar, which was a central symptom, I would suggest. The other observation I made was that she had scars from self-harming. So she'd obviously been through some trauma, um, traumas perhaps, and uh, people who self-harm are gaining a sensation where they don't normally gain a sensation. So they have hyposensitivity in the body. So they do things to create a sensory feedback um, and cutting and self-harming, hitting, um, knocking themselves, picking scabs. Actually, this lady was, uh, she said she was a habitual picker because she liked the sensation of, of doing that. And I think that's partly because she was so hyposensitive in that limb to do things to that limb gave her some sensory feedback that she was craving. So quite an interesting we case that one um, and sure enough in the uh, history she had a lot of traumatic losses of her safety relationships so she'd lost her mother she'd lost her sister and her, and some someone else that was close to her I think it was a grandparent so she didn't any longer feel that the world was a safe place so she was constantly wired for threat constantly going into fight or flight and dissociating from that left leg very interesting, aren't they, people? <laughs> people are, I mean. So um, you've probably heard of uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who's a psychologist, and he wrote a fantastic book called The Body Keeps the Score, which I sometimes recommend to people who have gone through trauma. But uh, what he suggests when it comes to people who have dissociated is that they need to restore being befriended with their body so they need to come back to being physically self-aware again so get restoring proprioceptive awareness restoring ability to detect different sensations and interpret those sensations accurately from around the body in the context of safety and in the context of controlling their physiological hyperarousal so some of the first things I've got to teach people is how to actually manage that fight or flight response um, and I'll just show you briefly how I do that later on. So it's all in the context of safety, reinterpretation against threat, not for threat. Um, but so this psychologist is saying that physical re befriending the body again becomes a very important part of re-engaging with themselves when they've dissociated. So just to finish off, I'm not quite sure how I'm doing for time. Yes, I've got a couple of minutes. Um, so just a couple of suggestions, really, because again, treatment for hyposensitivity in nociplastic pain hasn't yet been tested as far as I'm aware, but I'm, I'm certainly working on developing ideas and I'm hoping that some of you might want to take us, take some of these ideas ahead and, and do some research uh, in, in your facilities. That would be fantastic. But what I would always work on with people with hyposensitivity, knowing there's a trauma background, is what they call trauma-informed care. So there has to be safety. There has to be trust between myself and the patient. And there has to be trust that I'm not going to make them do things that they're too fearful of. Obviously, you push the boundaries a little bit and you challenge them gently, but you can't set them off into fear responses because they'll dissociate and shut down and that's it. Um, Pain neuroscience education is so important for these people because they're so confused about the body, they can't get the accurate feedback and interpret it correctly. So they don't know what's going on and it's frightening for them. So that sets off more fight or flight. Sometimes I'll tell them that it, it, it's not the limb's fault. It's not that the limb itself is faulty. It's actually the wiring and you know the brain function that's not um, firing on all cylinders. So we go down the, the central nervous system route as well as the psychology route. So the first thing after pain neuroscience education is to teach them how to regulate themselves, how to self-regulate their fight or flight responses. And this is where you pull in your psychologist because if there's been trauma, they need to understand why they respond to certain situations the way they do and unpack that and help them deal with these situations a little bit more um, control in a controlled way. So re reiterating the breathing, so getting them to learn to be aware of the breathing feedback, because we now know that people with anxiety aren't aware and they're not confident about what they feel. 
And so teaching them awareness and then teaching them actual breathing strategies to bring down the fight or flight. And um, also, you know, reducing some of the sensory overwhelm, little tips like binasal occlusion, which has actually been used for hypersensitivity to light after concussion in the research area, can be very helpful for these people too. So just putting these little bits of sticky tape, they're actually just opaque sellotape, it's not very technical, just on that inner tiny portion of their glasses, often their sunglasses perhaps, can help to reduce visual overwhelm. And little things like Karma earplugs, Karma is actually a brand name and I haven't got shares, but it's just a, the little ear gadgets, which these little pictures are down here, that filter some sound out, but don't completely block sound. Because often people who are traumatised do need to have a little bit of an ear out for danger. So to have complete earplugs in can uh, freak them out a little bit. But these Karma earplugs filter out ambient sound so that they're not getting so barraged with auditory um, sensory overload. Little things like that can be really helpful to help them regulate their fight or flight. And then for the body feedback, because the body feedback is lost um, or reduced anyway, Things like the weighted blanket can be really helpful. So I don't know if, if in Europe the weighted blanket is taking over the world, but in New Zealand it is. And it's because it's deep pressure throughout the whole body, which gives them a bit more sensory feedback to help them ground themselves so they feel more grounded. And when they feel where their body is more and they're reducing the excess barrage through the light and sound sensitivity, they feel better balanced in their senses. And that brings down fight or flight, which in turn, as we know, will bring down nociplastic pain symptoms as well. So the weighted blanket can be very useful, but if they can't um, take a blanket out with them, obviously, um, also a pressure feedback belt around the middle. So around their hips. So, you know, a Sorola belt, that's one brand of sacroiliac belt. I call it a pressure feedback belt because anything that gives them a bit of pressure around the um, pelvis, can give the brain a sensation of where their middle is, I tell patients, um, and that can give the feedback that they're lacking as well. And people can feel very grounded very quickly, and it's just a very useful therapeutic technique to use to help people self-regulate and get control again. Of course, when they feel a bit more in control, there's a bit more trust, and then that you know perpetuates onto the other things that you would do for your rehab. So we have um, we know from um, various recent review studies that sensory discrimination training on its own wouldn't work for chronic pain patients however sensory discrimination work in the context of trauma-informed care and in the context of controlling fight or flight and balancing their sensory processing can be very helpful indeed to help them restore that sensory awareness in hyposensitive areas um, I can use boba style trunk mobilization, which is just helping people be more aware of their trunk sensory feedback. And also mirror therapy can be really useful for restoring some of that sensory awareness without the threat of moving the limb if it's too painful initially. That's borrowed from the complex regional pain syndrome uh, literature. So just to conclude briefly, um, if there's no allodynia, which we do see in hypoesthesia cases with nociplastic pain symptoms, if there's no allodynia and limited hypersensitivity at the site of pain, because one of the things in the criteria is that there's hypersensitivity in the site of pain, if that's absent, should we then not diagnose them with nociplastic pain? You know, are we saying that if there's no hypersensitivity, then they haven't got nociplastic pain? Well, at the moment we are, but I'm just challenging that really, because I think that they still have nociplastic pain symptoms, but there's hyposensitivity in these situations. Or would it just be a new subgroup of nociplastic pain, which I think would be a good idea? Um, and or should we actually even you know, alter the algorithm a little bit to include it? I do think there's more research that needs to be done to look into this, but it's a, definitely a passion of mine because I think it's something that has been looked at in various populations and needs to be a, perhaps a little bit more collated into what we see and what we do for real people on the ground in the clinic. So thank you very much for listening and I'd be welcome, welcoming any questions now if we've got time left over, Chairman Joe.
Sure, we do, Jackie. Thanks a lot. Very clear presentation, highly informative. Uh, and I think this is connecting clinical practice with science to perfection. So thanks a lot. Uh, anyone who has questions, feel free to activate your microphone and your camera so that we can see you. Or if you're more comfortable with sharing your question in the chat, that's also fine with us whatever you're more convenient with. Perhaps before, so perhaps we need the people to become a bit familiar with the system to post their question in the chat or to activate their microphone. And so perhaps I can have a first a question to you. I guess the majority of the people that were uh, uh, listening to your lecture were already familiar with uh, perhaps your work, but for sure they were familiar with, with the fact that there is a close link between past trauma and uh, nociplastic pain. Uh, of course, you provide much more in-depth information on that aspect. Uh, if I un interpret your, your one of your last slides correctly, you propose that we should perhaps take them into account for an updated uh, nociplastic pain uh, criteria set mm. or not. Yes, well I think that um, perhaps we could include um, the hyposensitivity as either one of the comorbidities or, or, or possible features because there are patients who seem to have all the other aspects of hypersensitivity and nociplastic pain comorbidities like poor sleep for cognitive function, unrefreshed in the mornings, those comorbidities. Um, and yet they don't have the classic allodynia and hyperalgesia at the site of pain, which is what we um, list on the algorithm at the moment. So maybe we could say um, allodynia, hyperalgesia at the site of pain or hypoalgesia at the site of pain but still list the other comorbidities because they do seem to be apparent in conjunction with that's my thought. Yeah, it makes sense for sure. And in terms of treatment, you briefly highlighted and explained uh, some of the aspects that you provide uh, in, in the treatment part of, of your care for these patients. But do you also then um, uh, collaborate with a psychologist or psychiatrist to deal with the trauma experience or absolutely. in yes yeah. absolutely Joe because um, they need to unpack why they respond to threats in such a heightened way when these threats aren't even necessarily threats you know so to be able to unpack why they respond in certain ways helps them to understand themselves which is very empowering in itself and then helps them to reframe when something is happening to them. Is this really a real threat now? Does it warrant a big heightened physiological response which leads to pain and dissociation? So absolutely, yes, yeah. Finding good psychologists in my town is a challenge, <laughs> but I've found one or two, and one of them specialises in uh, abusive parenting backgrounds, so that's really helpful. So yes is the answer. And the psychiatrist or one of the psychiatrists of, of the University Hospital Brussels always tells us, well, uh, in case of past trauma, uh, exposure treatment is the number one evidence-based treatment for, for learning them to deal with uh, the past trauma and to somehow get a more steady state situation where they can also benefit much better from, for instance, physiotherapy care. Mm. Yes. So gradual exposure, graded exposure to threats, you mean? Yes, towards the past trauma, experience, traumatic experience that they had. Uh, oh, specifically, so they, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that makes a lot of sense. I suppose it's another form of graded exposure, but to more, more sort of background source fears, isn't it? Yeah. That's good. I, I think um, I, I try not to be a psychologist as well because I can get really carried away thinking I can fix so much when, when it's not my scope of practice. So, um, you know, I, I do try and leave it to them to do their thing, but liaise and make sure we're at least on the same page and explaining about pain in similar ways. 
but I wish I'd trained in psychology as well. So fascinating. <laughs> Absolutely. Vincent Hanna has posted a supportive comment in the chat. Vincent Hanna from University of Leuven and, and Antwerp. Uh, shares with you. Thank you for your presentation, Jackie. I definitely agree that there is a subgroup of people with a loss of function, hypo, rather than a gain of function, allodynia. Definitely more to look into. So that's very much supportive. Thank you for that, Vincent. Are there any other comments or questions from the audience? Kelly Ickmans also posted supportive comments. Thanks a lot, Jackie. That was very clear and informative. I couldn't agree more. Perhaps, uh, Jackie, then there is nothing more left than to thanks, thank you a lot. Uh, and perhaps a final question for you, of course, because we have recorded the session also and we will spread this also on, on social media. Uh, so perhaps it's also uh, possible uh, for people that are watching this lecture in a delayed mode uh, for you to contact them if they have some more questions or some more uh, advice that they want from you? Absolutely, yes, yeah. Um, I've got an email on the end slide here, where is it? There it is. So ah, okay. the, my email address is the VUB email, so Jacqueline.clark or jclark at painsandbrains.com. So my my uh, practice is called Pains and Brains. So I'd be very happy to answer questions and I do love to keep liaising with my European colleagues. So please do. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joe. I've really appreciated having this opportunity. So thank you and yeah, keep in touch. Okay, thanks a lot, Jackie. It was our honor to have you. A final thing that I want to share with everyone is a bit of publicity for the Pain Science in Motion uh, event. Uh, of course, many of you are well familiar with that. For those of you who aren't, uh, it's no longer possible to, uh, to uh, submit your abstract for the Pain Science in Motion event because the program is already set. But if you can still subscribe, of course, to join us in May in Maastricht in the Netherlands, uh, the, the Pain Science in Motion event is now uh, in its fourth edition and it's the only pain congress in the world dedicated fully to PhD candidates in the field of pain. So please join us all in Maastricht in May in the Netherlands. And thanks again, Jackie, for your wonderful lecture and everyone uh, watching us uh, uh, stay tuned because we have more Pain in Motion masterclasses coming up uh, later this year. Have a nice day everyone and see you next time.